Good morning. Give people a couple minutes to join us. Okay, while people are joining, let me do a little recap of what we've covered so far in chapter 26. Let's do it with the PowerPoint. So this chapter, chapter 26, is all about properties of light. And light is a very interesting phenomenon. All light is basically created by a charged particle, generally an electron, which is oscillating back and forth. And that oscillating share, Oops. as this electron is oscillating back and forth, it creates a changing electric field. And one of the things about relativity that Einstein discovered is that a changing electric field will create a changing magnetic field. A changing magnetic field will create a changing electric field. So as this, there's probably like an electron up here, as it's oscillating up and down, it's creating changing electric fields. That changing electric field creates an oscillating magnetic field. That oscillating magnetic field creates an oscillating electric field, and it just continues to sort of regenerate itself. Let's go back to this. Do, 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 do. When we're talking about the electromagnetic spectrum, we're generally talking about all the possible light forms that there are. So visible light is just an electromagnetic wave within a very specific frequency range that we as humans can see. So the electromagnetic spectrum is all frequencies of light. And it goes from radio waves, which have the longest wavelength and the shortest frequency, all the way up to gamma rays, which have the smallest wavelength, highest frequency. And if you look, visible light, whoa, I hate when that happens, doop, boop, 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 boop. Visible light is just a very, very small portion of all the light that's out there, sort of sandwiched between infrared and ultraviolet. And I kind of mentioned this, you don't need to know the exact value, but visible light is only about one millionth of 1% 1 of all of the light that's out there. So we are, in essence, blind to all other forms of light, except this light that falls within this range of four times 10 to the 14 hertz to about eight times 10 to the 14 hertz. And another interesting thing about light is, so light, as far as we know, is the fastest thing in the universe. So the speed of light, three times 10 to the eight meters per second or 186,000 miles per second. So what this means is as light is traveling, in one second, it will travel 186,000 miles. It is the fastest thing in the universe. As far as we know, nothing with mass, well, nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. One interesting thing is, even though the speed of light is the fastest thing in the universe, it is not infinitely fast. What that means is everything that you see every day you are actually seeing in the past because it takes some time for the light to get from that object to your eyes. If you're looking at the back of your hand, about a meter away, it takes light about a billionth of a second. And I think I mentioned in, do I have it somewhere here? Do, 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 light years, okay. Well, just in astronomy, distances are so great that we start measuring things and called light years. And a light year is how far light travels in a year. It's about six trillion miles. The cool thing about that is if something is one light year away, that means the light that's reaching the earth has been traveling through the space for a year to get to us. Now the closest star to us is Alpha Centauri. It's about 4.3 light years away, I think. 
which means it takes light from Alpha Centauri 4.3 years to get through space to us. For our sun, it's eight light minutes. Other cool thing about that is if you go out somewhere where you can see millions of stars, there's a good chance that some of those stars may not even exist anymore, but we wouldn't know about it for some time because the light that we see from stars has left thousands to millions of years ago and is just now reaching us on Earth. Other thing I talked about is, no, I did talk about that a little bit here, transparent materials. So in general, whenever, you know, I've got a surface here, you know, maybe this is light, glass, something. I've got this light coming in. Whenever light hits a surface, there's three possibilities for what can happen. That light can get absorbed. And if it does, light has energy. So if an object absorbs light, it will heat up because it will basically absorb the energy that that light had. It can get reflected. And in chapter 28, we'll talk about reflection and refraction. So it'll just bounce backwards or it can pass through. A transparent material is one that allows light to pass through it. So what I went through was, how does light get through, let's say, a pane of glass? So here is just, you know, a piece of glass, and, you know, there's millions and millions and millions of atoms in the glass. But let's just look at four of them. What ends up happening is you've got this incoming light, and that light gets to the very first atom in the glass, that atom will absorb the light. Technically, an electron in the atom will absorb the light. That light now disappears from the universe. It's no longer there. The energy the light had is absorbed by the electron, causes the electron to start to oscillate up and down at the same frequency the light had. Then that electron will emit its own light. It's a new piece of light. It's not the same light that was absorbed, but it's identical. Same wavelength, same frequency. So then, this emitted light will then come to the second atom. An electron in that second atom will absorb that new piece of light. That light is gone. That electron will start to oscillate up and down, pass the light forward, and it's constantly getting absorbed, re-emitted, absorbed, re-emitted, absorbed, re-emitted as it's passing through the glass. A couple things about that is, in between atoms is basically a vacuum. So in between atoms, light is traveling at the speed of light, 186,000 miles per second. However, let's say when this atom absorbs this piece of light and then re-emits another piece, it doesn't do that instantaneously. There's a small time delay between when something is absorbed and re-emitted. Because of that, it will take light longer to travel through glass than it does through a vacuum. It'll take light longer to travel through our atmosphere than it does a vacuum because the way it gets through a transparent material is getting absorbed, re-emitted, absorbed, re-emitted, absorbed, re-emitted thousands and thousands and thousands of times. Whew. Let me stop for a second. That is what I have covered so far in chapter 26. Let me just open it up a second for any questions I can answer on anything I've covered so far. If not, recap's coming off. Dun, 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 dun. Okay, so we don't have that much left. Oh, Brian, question? I did, I, I did have a question. Not about the like the stuff we just did, but I, I saw your email you sent out for the um, celebration uh, review okay. stuff. Um, I don't know if you touched on that. I kind of joined late. I, I was reading that, um, but uh, I, I was looking on uh, conceptual physics and like it doesn't show up that we have a, a, a celebration coming up and it just says like the readings. Oh, so it won't, you won't be able to see it until Friday at eight. Oh, okay. So then so it's there. Like, you know, it's just um, giving people basically like a 48 hour window to take it starting okay. tomorrow at 8 a.m. You'll be able to see it and it'll be right. available until 1159 Saturday night. And how, how long do we have? The, I don't know if you mentioned the last class. Uh, 90 minutes. It's 50 oh, okay. multiple choice questions. It should be oh, okay. plenty of time. For sure. For sure. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Oh, wait, and, there's like, and there's no other assignments due this week, right? Other than the Now, chapter 26, uh, I'm not collecting it. I'll show you. I have the homework already posted for you guys, the solutions. So I would do it just to study, but I'm not collecting chapter six just to give you a little bit more time to for study sure. the celebration. Thank you. Okay. Are there any other questions just on chapter 26 stuff?
Okay, let's continue with the rest of chapter 26. Oh, is there a chat? Let me see. Just a quick minor. Uh, yep, got it. Uh, do, 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 do. So like I was saying, there is a slight time delay between when something gets absorbed and when it gets re-emitted. And because of that, what we're gonna see, this will come into play in chapter 28, light travels at different speeds through different materials. Even though light always travels at the same speed in a vacuum, the way it gets through a transparent material is getting absorbed and re-emitted all continuously from atom to atom to atom. That absorption and re-emission process takes a small fraction of a second, maybe a billionth of a second, but the more interactions, the more time it's gonna to take to get through transparent material. Now, what is an opaque material? This is basically just one that you can't see through. And what happens with an opaque material is it's going, it's going, <laughs> going to absorb light without re-emitting it. So you remember the way it gets through a transparent material is the light comes in, you've got an atom that absorbs the light, starts to oscillate up and down, it re-emits the light. What happens with an opaque material is this light comes in, it gets absorbed by an electron in an atom, let's say in the glass, but rather than just oscillating a little bit and then passing the light on, what happens is materials are opaque to frequencies that match their own natural frequencies. And in essence, what we have is this resonance phenomenon. Remember, if you were to push an object at just the same frequency that it naturally wants to oscillate at, you cause what's called resonance, and you cause the amplitude to increase dramatically. Well, if the light that's coming in matches one of the resonant frequencies of the atoms in the material, when that light gets absorbed, rather than just oscillating a little bit and then having the light re-emitted, the atom starts to oscillate wildly because of resonance. And then what happens is it, it bangs into other atoms and it transfers the energy that it absorbed to other atoms in the form of heat. So the thing to keep in mind is materials are opaque to frequencies of light that match their natural frequencies. No, oh, I actually just have that written right here. <laughs> I don't need to rewrite that. So if light comes in and it doesn't match the natural frequency of the glass or the atmosphere or whatever it's passing through, it will get absorbed and then re-emitted and then absorbed and then re-emitted and so on. However, if the light happens to match one of the natural frequencies, then when it gets absorbed, it starts to oscillate wildly. Well, not wildly, but it oscillates a lot up and down and then it loses that energy that it absorbed to heat as it collides with other atoms. <sighs> so let me just pause for a second. So if the material, if light is coming in, matches one of the natural frequencies of the atoms in the material, atoms will absorb that light and it won't re-emit it. It will cause the atom and the electrons to start to oscillate a lot and then it will bang into other neighboring atoms and molecules and lose the energy as heat. If it doesn't match a natural frequency, then the atoms will absorb it, oscillate a little bit, and then re-emit it. And then another atom will absorb it, oscillate a little bit, and re-emit it. And really, this is how all color works. Chapter 27 is all about color. So like this is a blue shirt. What's happening is white light consists of light of all frequencies. So we kind of have the spectrum Roy G. Bib. White light is a combination of all frequencies of light. I've got white light from my lamp, which is hitting this shirt. Certain frequencies of light are getting absorbed. Because of that, the shirt will heat up a little bit. Other frequencies, in this case, are getting reflected back. We haven't gotten a reflection yet, but this shirt is blue because I have white light hitting it. Some of the light is getting absorbed. Some of it's getting reflected back to wherever. You're seeing blue because this shirt is absorbing all frequencies of light but blue, and blue is what's getting reflected back to you. So some materials will absorb certain frequencies of light, some materials will let certain frequencies pass through, 
Some materials will reflect certain frequencies of light. So does that mean that something that's white is not absorbing any light? Exactly what it means. And something that's black is absorbing all frequencies of light. So this is why, like, if you're trying to stay cool when it's sunny out, you want to wear something that's light because anytime a material absorbs light, it heats up. And so it, uh, <clears throat> I had this really great tie-dye shirt when I was a kid, and half of it was this really cool sun pattern, really bright orange. The other half was this really cool moon pattern. It was very dark. And I remember hiking in the sun one time, and there must have been a 20 degree difference between the front of my shirt and the back of your shirt. So if something's black, it's absorbing all the frequencies of light that hit it. If something's white, it's reflecting all the frequencies of light that hit it. And one interesting thing, when you look at the whole spectrum, let me just throw this out real quick, uh, share screen, let's go back to this. Uh, the spectrum of visible light we're gonna to get to is, we'll see Roy G. Biv in terms of the colors. So red, orange, yellow, these are low frequency. Green is sort of middle frequency. Blue, indigo, and violet is high frequency. Now, I could tell you what the specific frequency is for red, what the specific frequency is for violet, not super important, but there is no frequency of white light there is no frequency of black light. In a sense, they're not really colors, they're just combinations of colors or the absence of color. So white, we see white when we detect all frequencies of light at the same time. We see black when we don't detect any light. All right, so let me stop that again and just see if there's any questions on. So to keep in mind, Object will let light pass through it. If that light doesn't match one of its natural frequencies, it'll absorb the light, re-emit it, absorb, re-emit it, and so on. If it does match one of the natural frequencies, then it will absorb that light, not re-emit it, and that absorbed light will cause the object to heat up. So when we see blue, we are seeing a frequency. Yes. So every one of the colors, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and actually we just, Share this one more time. Ba, 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 ba. PowerPoint. So yeah, there's a specific frequency for each color. So red, you know, the frequency is around four times ten to the fourteen hertz. Violet, the frequency is about eight times ten to the fourteen hertz. And there's a specific frequency for every single color. But there is no frequency of white light. There is no frequency of black light white combination of all colors, black the absence of color. Okay, uh, any other quick questions I can answer before we jump into the very last parts of chapter 26? Okay, so the last two things, why does frequency make color? <clears throat> uh, let me come back to that once I look to at the eye. So the last two things we're gonna look at in this chapter are eclipses, and how our eye sees. So let me, uh, how do I do this? Uh, PowerPoint. Sorry, this scheme ahead. Okay. So, one, let's just before we talk about eclipses, we got to talk a little bit about shadows. And I'm not going to spend too much time on this. But in physics, we actually classify two different kinds of shadows. So, one, what is a shadow? It's really just a region of space where light rays can't reach because they're being blocked. So like in this particular slide, you've got this source of light, could be a light bulb or something like that, and you have some object here. We call a total shadow, meaning no light from that source at all is reaching an area. We actually differentiate between sort of a partial shadow and a total shadow. So an umbra is a region like this, where absolutely no light at all is reaching a surface. But you can also have what's called a partial shadow. And that happens when some of the light is blocked, but you have other light that can get there. So like this region right here is a penumbra because most of the light is getting blocked, but you do have a little bit of light getting through. And that becomes important because once we see solar eclipses, 
people will fly from all over the country to get to a total solar eclipse. And that only happens on very specific spots on the earth where you have an umbra. All right, uh, don't worry about this shadow one. So before we just talk about solar eclipses, hopefully at some point you guys studied this, why does the moon appear to have different phases? Right, you probably know the moon is like on a 28 day cycle where it goes from full moon to new moon. Well, the moon is not emitting its own light, obviously. It's not a star. So the only way we see the moon is by sunlight from our sun reflecting off the moon. So anytime you see the moon being illuminated, that's because there's light from the sun hitting the moon and then reflecting to us. Well, how, when do we see a full moon? So a full moon is when the sun, moon, and earth positions are shown right here. So here's the nighttime part of the earth. Where's my thing? So over here, right, this is this part, this half of the earth is in the nighttime because we're not facing the sun. Well, the moon is getting hit by the sun. Where's my thing? And this part of the moon is, so you got light from the sun hitting the moon, getting reflected. So this part of the moon is lit up. So we can see a full moon from the dark side of the earth. When do we see a new moon, which is basically like seeing no moon at all? Well, in this case, the moon is now over on this side. So we are on the nighttime here, and you cannot see the moon being illuminated because this half of the moon facing the sun is what the sunlight is hitting. And so the side of the moon that's facing us, I don't have any light getting reflected back from it. So the whole thing with the phases of the moon is just how much of the moon is being illuminated by the sun so that we can see it. Okay. So lunar eclipses, a lunar eclipse happens. And the big thing to keep in mind is when the moon is completely in the earth's shadow. So the location of the sun, moon, and earth for a lunar eclipse is you have the, well, it's kind of right here, but you've got the sun, you've got the earth, and you've got the moon. none of the light from the sun can reach the moon because the earth is completely blocking it. So the moon is completely within the earth's shadow. So the location of the moon is kind of shown here. You've got the sun, earth, here's the moon. The moon is completely within the earth's shadow. No sunlight is reaching the moon at all. So you cannot see the moon. One interesting thing, let me just say, if anybody's ever seen a complete and total lunar eclipse, when the moon is completely within the Earth's shadow, it doesn't just go black, you can actually see a red moon. So here's the moon starting to go into the Earth's shadow. Here's when it's almost completely, and then once it's completely within the Earth's shadow, you have this small region of time where the moon appears to be red. And why does that happen? Well, we're going to talk about this a bit in uh, next chapter, but when we talk about sunsets and sunrises, but what happens is our atmosphere can actually bend light. And so normally light, so here's the earth, here's the moon, here's the sun. If light just traveled in a straight line, and actually let me use a different color because red does get bent. So let me go to blue. So most of the light from the sun is gonna get completely blocked by the earth. And so none of it is gonna actually make it to this moon. But what ends up happening is our atmosphere can actually bend light. And we'll talk about this in next chapter because of that, our atmosphere can actually cause certain frequencies of light not to travel in a straight line, but to bend as they're passing through our atmosphere. And it ends up that our atmosphere on the earth 
will bend red light better than any other color. And so what happens is most of the light during a total lunar eclipse does not reach the moon. But red light will get bent by the Earth's atmosphere. And so our moon can actually appear red when it's completely within the Earth's shadow because the red light, rather than traveling in a straight line and missing the moon, will get bent by the Earth's atmosphere and then hit the moon. Kind of pretty cool. OK, so one quick question that sometimes comes up. If the sun is here, Earth is here, moon is here, and the moon is in orbit around the Earth, why don't we have a lunar eclipse every single month? So if you imagine I had this moon just sort of going in orbit around the Earth, it would seem like once a month we would have a lunar eclipse, and that doesn't happen. Why not? I'm trying to think if I have enough stuff to show this. Uh, got a coffee mug. I got an easy button. Uh, <laughs> do you imagine the sun out here here's the earth here's the moon the moon is not in orbit in sort of a straight line what ends up happening is the orbit is tilted and so ah, it's kind of hard to see but you can do it over here the moon is actually in an orbit that's something more like this than going in this direction. Well, it's not that important, but it's hard to actually demonstrate unless I can have a bunch of things to show you. But we don't have a lunar eclipse every single month because the, align the alignment of the sun, earth, and moon doesn't allow that. Okay, so last thing for eclipses, a solar eclipse. So I don't know if anybody's ever seen a total solar eclipse. I haven't, but our lab tech, John, and one of our other instructors, Sue, have, and they are hooked. They just, every time there's a solar eclipse now, they will literally fly across the country, across the globe, to go see it. And there's a lot of people that do. And I've never seen one personally. I want to, but it's supposed to be almost like a spiritual experience. So what happens for a solar eclipse is that the location in this case is, if you remember, for a lunar eclipse, we had sun, where's my little, sun, earth, moon. The moon was within the shadow of the earth. For a solar eclipse, what's happening is the moon is blocking out the sunlight in parts of the earth. So for a solar eclipse, what we have is the sun, You've got the moon, and then you've got the Earth. And the thing about a solar eclipse, here's where the whole difference between a partial shadow and a total shadow comes into play. There's only a very small region of the Earth whenever there's a solar eclipse that undergoes a total solar eclipse where you actually have the moon completely blocking out the sun, most other parts of the Earth will have what's called a partial eclipse. So in this figure, this right here, this region where I have a complete shadow, that would be a total eclipse. And this whole region where I sort of have a partial shadow is where I'd have a partial eclipse. And something that's kind of cool about solar eclipses is our sun is so much bigger than it actually appears when I look up at the sky. What you would see, so one, here is the moon sort of starting to block the light from the sun. So this is the moon moving into the sun's path. Well, once the moon is completely blocking the sun, what you see is called the corona of the sun. So the middle of the sun is the brightest part of the sun, but the sun is much bigger than we can see when we look up at in terms of just the actual size. This outer part of the sun here, is called the corona. And we never generally see it because the middle part of the sun is so bright, it completely overwhelms the dim outer part of the sun. Same reason why we can't see stars in the daytime. 
It's just the sunlight in our atmosphere completely overwhelms the dim light from the stars. So in this case, when the moon is completely blocking the sun, then we can see the sort of outer portion of the sun, which we call the corona. Okay, let me pause for a second. 10 o'clock, we got 15 minutes. I can cover the eye, and then I'll do a little bit in office hours for viewing. Let me just pause, open it up for questions about eclipses. I was just curious, didn't we have a solar eclipse like three years ago? Oh, we had a solar eclipse uh, last year, I think. Oh, was it? Okay. I remember really looking, really... yeah, I remember looking up at it with the welding mask on like three, four years ago. Yeah. One of the really cool things about solar eclipses is like we know exactly when they're going to happen and they know the exact path that the solar eclipse is going to take. Like we know, okay, it's going to be available to see in this location at this time and then at this time you can see it. So people will, I think the next one is in two years or something, people will start booking tickets to the next solar eclipse once the first one, the other one's done. It's a big thing and I've never- So they can, um, they can track lunar eclipses too or is it oh, hard? You know, astronomers know so much, yeah. So we know when solar eclipses, when lunar eclipses are going to happen for however many years in the future you want. And you could probably look that up. I'm sure there's a site that'll tell you exactly when the next one's going to be. In fact, I know there is. I just don't know which one it is. Okay. So, oh, and I, I think someone had a question in the chat. There was a question down there. Uh, when we see blue, we're seeing why does frequency, oh yeah. So we're gonna talk about this, why does frequency make color? Uh, I'm gonna introduce it now and then talk about it more in chapter 27. Really, it's just our eye, how our eye is interpreting the electromagnetic waves that hit it. So actually, let's jump into it. Uh, screen share. Okay, so a couple things just about the eye. One, if we had more time, I'd really like to spend a bunch of time if we were talking about lenses. But one of the things about the eye, anytime you look at an object, the shape of your lens is changing. Because what ends up happening is light has to always get focused onto the back of your eye called the retina. And that's where you have sort of these light detecting things called rods and cones. In order for light to always hit the back of your eye and form an image, the shape of your lens is constantly changing. So when you look at something far away, your lens of your eye will have a slightly different shape than when you look at something close up. Let me just throw this out here now. When you're looking at something close up, these little ciliary muscles tighten. And so your eyes can actually get tired if you're reading for a long time, and it is a physical thing. You are exerting a muscular effort to keep the lens of your eye in a specific shape to read something close. So if your eyes are tired from reading for a long time, how do you rest your eyes? You look at something far away. When you look at something far away, your lens is in the most relaxed position. But when you're reading something close, your eyes have to sort of, these ciliary muscles have to tense up. So just a few little things, a couple things. So you've got light that's coming in, goes through um, the opening, hits a lens, and then the lens will focus the light onto the back of your eye called the retina. And I'll go through this, but you have all these little light sensors on your retina called rods and cones. And then all of these different rods and cones will then send a signal from the optic nerve to your brain. One interesting thing, you may know this, but we have a blind spot in our eye, meaning there's no rods or cones in this region because this is where the optic nerves leave the eye and then go to the brain. So this little region right here is a blind spot. Any light hitting that region of your eye, you cannot see. Now, how come we never notice a blind spot? And actually, let me just stop this because it's such a cool concept. How come we never notice that there's a spot in our eye that we're completely blind to? Well, one, if we have both eyes open, the blind spot in one eye gets filled in by the other eye. But even if I just have one eye open, 
there is a region of space where I shouldn't be able to see anything because there's no rods or cones in my eye in that spot. So why can I still see something? And the answer is because your brain fills in the details with what it thinks should be there. You are hallucinating every single day because you're seeing things that you shouldn't really be seeing. In a sense, your brain is making it up. So if you have both eyes open, you've got the blind spot from one eye getting filled in by the other eye. But even if you only have one eye open, you don't see a dark spot where your blind spot is. And the region is, the reason is, is because your brain is filling in what it thinks should be there. Your brain's badass. <laughs> All right, continuing forward. So <clears throat> the phobia is sort of this region that's right beyond or in line with your lens. This is where we have sort of the clearest vision. We can see greater detail there than anywhere else. And without going, and I don't, to tell you the truth, I don't understand the whole biology behind how the rods and cones work. But what I can just tell you is they're sort of like antenna. They detect light and then they send a signal to our brain. We have two different kinds of antenna and they're either called rods or cones. And I remember cones because they're color. So our cones can see color. Our rods cannot. Our rods are sensitive to lightness and darkness, and they're very sensitive to motion. So this is sensitive to lightness and darkness, but not color, but it's also sensitive to motion. And we're going to get to this next chapter, but we have three different kinds of cones sensitive to high frequency light, middle frequency light, and low frequency light. So we have a uh, set of cones that are sensitive to red, orange, yellow, set of cones that are sensitive to sort of green, and a set of cones that are sensitive to blue, indigo, and violet. And then how those cones get stimulated, you may know this, most computer monitors, well, in fact, all monitors, all those millions of colors you see are really just a combination of three different colors added together, red plus green plus blue. You can add red, green, and blue in any combination to produce any other color. And that's because of the way our cones work. If I have, so just to be clear, low frequencies, red, orange, yellow, middle is green, higher frequencies is blue, indigo, and violet. So like if you had red light coming in, what it would do is it would hit your cones in the eye that are sensitive to low frequency light. Those cones would then send a signal to your brain and then your brain interprets that frequency of light as a color. And not everybody sees colors exactly the same way. Okay, so you don't need to know these numbers, but rods and cones are named sort of because of the way they look. So in the human eye, there's about six to seven million cones and about 75 to 150 million rods. So the cones are sort of, sort of these bigger ones. I mean, they don't quite look like cones, but the rods kind of look like rods. The cones are concentrated at the fovea. So sort of that middle part of the eye. And as you get farther from the fovea, you have less and less cones, more and more rods. So rods are concentrated towards the periphery. A couple things. So one, I would have done this demo, but I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but you can't see color out of your peripheral vision. And if we were doing this live, what I would have done is taken like a bright color of construction paper, had you look at it with your peripheral vision, and one, you'll see that peripheral vision is very sensitive to motion. So if I'm looking at my hand out of my peripheral vision, I can see if it's moving, but when it's not moving, I can't really see it. And this sort of comes about because of evolution. Way back in caveman times, if you saw a saber-toothed tiger out of the corner of your eye, you didn't need to know what kind of coat it had in terms of the colors and things like that. You just needed to see motion. And once you saw motion, then you knew you needed to react. 
So over the years and years and years and millions of years of evolution, we've evolved so that our peripheral vision can sense motion really, really well, but we can't see color with our peripheral vision. We can only see color with our rods. And one interesting thing is, even if I have, let's say, red light shining, that red light has to have enough energy to cause our cones to fire a signal to our brain. It takes more energy to activate cones than it does rods. Because of this, there's a couple things. One, if I have low intensity light, so just in a sense, weak light, if that light is weak enough, it will not cause the cones of our eye to fire a signal. This is why kind of interesting stars are bright. I'm sorry, stars are white. Stars are actually brightly colored. The color of a star depends upon its temperature. You've got red stars, you've got blue stars, you've got yellow stars, you've got white stars. All stars on the earth appear white to us because the light is so weak, so dim, that it doesn't cause our cones to fire a signal. It just causes our rods to. And so we see in black and white when light is not dim enough or not bright enough. So this is why, you know, if you get up in the middle of the night and it's sort of just barely light, everything appears sort of black and white because if there's not enough light, your cones will not fire a signal. And uh, do I want to go into the difference between that? No. So let me just touch on a couple other things. So those were some notes from PowerPoint. Actually, before I do this last piece, human eye, let me just stop for a second. Uh, any questions just about that? So our eye is constantly changing shape as we are looking at things at different distances away. Light comes in, gets focused under the back of our eye called the retina, and there are two kinds of antenna to detect this light. I've got cones, which are sensitive to color, and I've got rods, which are sensitive to lightness and darkness and motion. It takes a certain amount of energy to cause our cones to fire a signal, so if the light is too dim, we cannot see color. All right, let me pause just the questions on that. If not, I'm gonna do a quick little couple minutes, finish up on that. I have a question. Okay. Um, what causes other animals to have better night vision than humans? Uh, the okay. quick and easy answer is evolution. <laughs> but like what part of their eye is different than ours? That, oh, uh, you know? I don't know. Yeah, I have a short answer. Some yeah. animals, some animals have more types of uh, rods and cones than we have. So, like you said, we only have three different types. Uh huh. Um, some of them have upwards of like twelve. Like the mantis shrimp has twelve uh, different cones. Oh, really? So they can, yeah, they can see more colors than we can. Oh, and also, you know, some women can actually tend to see colors differently than men. I forget what it is, but I think it takes, in general, less light to cause the cones of women to fire than it does for men. I'd have to look that up. And also, like, some people can see into higher portions of the spectrum than others. You know, just like sound, not everybody can hear high-frequency sounds. Not everybody sees light the same way. And so, like, people that are colorblind, You've got, let's say, the frequency that corresponds to red that most people see hitting somebody's eye. And then there's different reasons people can be colorblind, but those cones that would be processing it are either not processing it the right way or it's getting mixed up or something like that. So yeah, everybody sees generally the same colors, but some people can see slightly higher frequencies of violet than others. Bees can see into the ultraviolet portion of the spectrum. Something I recently learned because my daughter and I love watching nature shows is lots of flowers, the pollen will uh, glow in ultraviolet. And so one of the ways that bees and other birds can always find sort of these flowers is because it's emitting not visible light, but ultraviolet light and they can sense it and they can see in ultraviolet. It's pretty damn cool. Okay, so just, Anything else? There's a Radio Lab podcast about this titled Colors. Ooh, I'm gonna write that down. Radio Lab. Colors.
Okay, so the very last, uh, let me just finish this up with the notes. So again, going through this, light, which is entering the eye, gets focused onto rods and cones. I'm just kind of calling them like light antenna. Keep in mind the cones are sensitive to color. And we'll go through this more next chapter, but there's three different kinds of cones for humans. Low frequency, middle frequency, and high frequency. Rods are sensitive to lightness and darkness, but not color, but they're very sensitive to motion. And our rods are basically in the periphery of our eye. So our peripheral vision, we're sensitive to motion, but we're not sensitive to light, to color, but we can see sort of motion and lightness and darkness. Like I said, it takes more energy to activate cones than it does the rods. So if the light is too dim, we are not going to be able to see color. Stars are brightly colored, but to us on the earth, they look white because the light is too dim to cause our cones to send a signal to our brain. And then, like I said, in our peripheral vision, we're really only sensitive to motion, and this is most likely a result of evolution. Over the years, the people who could actually see things that were dangerous in their peripheral vision tended to survive, and then over the years, we've just evolved to have very good peripheral vision for detecting motion. And then one last thing I'll just mention, and I won't tell you which way this goes, but we did, uh, I think when we were talking about circuits, I talked about lie detectors. And the way a lie detector works is you just have sort of these little electrodes. And when somebody's lying, in general, they tend to get a little bit nervous and they'll perspire just a little bit, not like you're dripping with sweat. But when that happens, the resistance of the human body changes and that's what they're looking at. Well, you can beat that if you can sort of lie unemotionally. But the size of our pupils is also related to emotions. Actually, I guess I did write this here. In general, our pupils are bigger when we're pleased and our pupils tend to contract when we're not pleased. What this means is if you watch somebody's pupils, you can tell when they're lying sometimes by the size of their pupils. And if you saw, uh, what was it, Blade Runner, where they're trying to tell whether these are androids or people, they're looking at the pupil and the response of the pupil. So modern lie detectors now, rather than looking at the resistance of the human body and how that changes, they look at the pupils and they're looking for changes in the size of the pupils. So if you've ever come to office hours and tried to give me an excuse for I can't do this because of this and that, I'm looking at your pupils and I can tell if you're lying or not. <laughs> I'm just kidding, I can't. <laughs> and so that is it for chapter 26. Uh, how do we know the stars are so colorful? Basically just from the many, many, many different kinds of telescopes that we have. So like the Hubble telescope, and I think I mentioned this when I talked to other one, Hubble telescope has seen a quasar which is just one of these, it's a, basically a star that has a neutrons. Anyway, it's a very, very, very bright star. We have seen a quasar, I think, which is 13 billion light years away, which means this quasar was formed near the beginning of the universe, 13 billion years ago, and the light from that quasar is just now reaching Earth which means when we get light from this quasar, we're actually seeing it as it was 13 billion years ago when the light first left. Cool stuff. Okay, so I am officially <laughs> ending lecture, bringing in office hours. And office hours, what I wanna do is, one, answer any questions, but start going through just some stuff about the second celebration and reviewing. So before I do, let me open it up. Any questions on chapter 26, anything that I just covered? So a shooting star, isn't that a star dying like a long time ago? A shooting star that we see in our atmosphere? Yeah. Oh no, a shooting star in our atmosphere is just a meteorite that's about the size of a pea. So what's happening is this whole thing, E equals MC squared, 
a small amount of mass can get converted into a tremendous amount of energy. So things that we see as shooting stars are really just teeny asteroids that are not much bigger than a pea or a small rock, moving at tremendous speeds through our atmosphere, heating up so much that they start to glow and in essence, all of their mass gets converted into heat and light. Uh, and one thing, let me just share uh, the homework for chapter 26. I have on your online resources page the solutions, but I also have the solutions at the end of the PowerPoint slides for chapter 26. And actually, while I'm doing this, let me just share a few things for resources. So on your Physics 10 online resources page, actually, I'm not sure if I'm sharing this. Let me do it again, share. I have, one, I will post the second lecture right now, but I have solutions to everything that you've turned in through Mastering Physics so far. So all of the homeworks for chapter 22, 23, 24, 19, and 20 and then the quizzes and then chapter 26 homework and then keep in mind also that i still have on your physics 10 website the old sort of practice quizzes so i would go through these six practice quizzes you know each one if you click on it is just giving you a multiple choice 10 question multiple choice review pretty good chance that you're going to see some of these questions again all right and then just in terms of some information about the second celebration. So we have looked at six chapters sort of since our first celebration, since sort of moving online. We've got chapter 22, which is all about electrostatics. And that was really just charges at rest. We weren't looking at charges moving, just charges at rest. Chapter 23 was all about electric current. So what happens as when I have moving charge, charge moving through a circuit, then we looked at magnetism. Chapter 19 was all about vibrations and waves, the properties of waves. Chapter 20 was sound. And then chapter 26 that we just covered was properties of light. The celebration will be 50 multiple choice questions, two points each, so a total of 100 points and it will be approximately evenly covered for each chapter. So six chapters, 50 multiple choice questions, figure eight questions from each chapter, a couple chapters will have nine questions. It will be available to everybody starting Friday morning. What's today? Thursday, starting tomorrow at 8 a.m. You have about 24 hours, 48 hours to complete it. Well, you don't have that long, but I'm giving people a window of about two days to do it. Once you start it, you will have 90 minutes to complete it. It is open book, open notes, but no internet searches. I'm expecting people to do fairly well. It's just going to be like a longer quiz. So you've got the notes, you've got your book, you should have plenty of resources. Let me just say that you will want to study, even though it's open book, open notes, because given 90 minutes, if you have to try and look up every answer or things like that, you're not gonna have enough time. So what I'd recommend is however you would study for the first celebration, creating a cheat sheet or something like that, still a good idea for this one. Okay, and then uh, let's just kind of go through some of the important things from each chapter. Actually, before I do that, let me just open it up. Any general questions just about taking the celebration? So available tomorrow, starting at 8 a.m., has to be completed and submitted before uh, Saturday, 11.59 p.m. You have 90 minutes once you click start. Open notes, open book, no internet searches, should be fairly straightforward, 50 multiple choice questions. Uh, Alyssa, you got a question? Anybody gone once? Okay. Uh, ooh, I got uh, six minutes. Do we time 9.40? No, wait, 9.30. Oh, no, we got to 10.45. <laughs> okay, let's talk about some things about electrostatics. So, wow, chapter 22, that was a while ago. That was like right when all this thing was happening. 
So chapter 22, electrostatics charges at rest. Our most basic thing is opposite charges attract, like charges repel. So two positive charges are going to repel each other. Two negative charges are going to repel each other. A positive and a negative charge are going to attract each other. Most objects are neutral because they have the same number of protons as they do electrons. How does an object get charged? Always, always, always by gaining or losing electrons, not protons, because they're trapped in the nucleus by the strong nuclear force. If something gains an electron, it's going to be negatively charged and it's going to be a negative ion. So this is something that gains an electron. An electron we write as E minus. A positive ion is something that's positively charged and it's positively charged because it lost one or more electrons. The difference between a conductor and an insulator is simply that conductors have a bunch of electrons that aren't bound to any particular atom. They're sort of freely moving around. An insulator is something where all of the electrons are tightly bound to the atoms. Uh, the force that describes the, 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 the equation that describes the force between two charges is called Coulomb's law. And we're not really using this equation to do any calculations, but keep in mind the force is proportional to one over the distance squared. This means whatever happens to the distance, you have to square that, and that's how the force is affected. And farther apart the objects are, the weaker the force, the closer together the objects are, the stronger the force. So if I had two charges that were some distance apart, and they had exert a certain force on each other, if I move them so now they're twice as far apart, the force is going to decrease but it doesn't decrease by a factor of two, it decreases by a factor of two squared, which is four, so it's four times weaker. Talked about the ways of charging an object, charging by friction, charging by contact, and charging by induction. Uh, don't worry about lightning, not gonna talk about that. So polarization though, this happens when one part of an atom or molecule or material is more positively or negatively charged than the other. So keep in mind that, you know, if I had a charged rod, so let's say this charged is, is negatively charged. And you remember what happens when I attract a pith ball, one of those little sort of light balls that we were doing demos with. The presence of the rod causes the charges on the pith ball to start to separate. And what's going to happen is the like charges are going to get attracted. The opposite charges are going to get repelled. Overall, it's still neutral because it hasn't lost or gained any electrons, but the charge has separated. So one part is more positive. The other part is more negative. We call that electric polarization. And the reason that this would be attracted to the rod is even though one side is attracted and the other side is repelled, since the opposite charges are closer, the attractive force is stronger than the repulsive force. Uh, don't worry about uh, this part, but keep in mind, if a charge is at rest, it has an electric field around it. And what we learned in chapter 24 is if the charge is moving, not only does it have an electric field, it also has a magnetic field. Uh, chapter 23 is about electric current. Current is just the flow of charge from one spot to another. We measure current in amps, and an amp is the flow of one coulomb of charge per second. And a coulomb is a tremendous amount of charge. It's the charge on 6.25 billion billion electrons. Ohm's law is one of the big, big things from this. And it says how much current flows in a circuit depends upon two things, the voltage you connect the circuit to and the resistance. Resistance is just how much something doesn't want to let charge flow through it. For a wire, resistance depends upon the thickness of the wire, the length of the wire, and the kind of wire, and also the temperature. 
Higher temperatures mean more resistance. Uh, speed and source of electrons in a circuit. So one, when you plug something into an outlet, you are not getting electrons from P, G, and E. You're just getting the energy to move electrons that are already present in any kind of wire. So like this. Well, Anyway, I was going to bring something, but anything that's got a wire has some kind of conducting material in it. That conductor has a bunch of electrons which aren't attached to any particular atom. When you connect that wire to an outlet or to a circuit, that circuit or that outlet is providing the energy to move the electrons that are already present in the wire itself. Other big thing from this is knowing the difference between series and parallel circuits. Series would be one in which there is no choice for how current's gonna flow. So if I were to make a circuit with three light bulbs in series, this is sort of what the circuit would look like. You would have electrons traveling from the negative to the positive terminal of the battery. And in a series circuit, there is no choice. Current has to flow through all three devices. The more devices you connect together in series, the bigger the resistance, the smaller the current's gonna be. The big thing about things in series is, if one of these were to go out because you turned on a switch or something like that, you shut it off, all of the devices would go out. This is bad, you do not want this generally. Our house is not connected like this. If it was, everything would have to be on in order for one thing to work. Most devices in our house are connected, well, it's a little bit more complicated, but in what's called parallel. And in parallel, there's multiple paths for current to flow. So this would be three light bulbs connected in parallel. Each one behaves independently. So if I were to turn off let's say two of the lights. Even though now there's no path for these to flow, I still can have current flowing through the other one. Each device behaves independently. And this is how most houses are connected. So you do not have to have the coffee maker on anytime you wanna run the microwave or things like that. Uh, chapter 24, magnetism. First key concept, all magnetism comes from moving electric charge. If I have a charge at rest, it has an electric field around it. But if that charge is moving, in addition to an electric field, it also has a magnetic field. All magnets have a north and south pole. As far as we know, you can never, ever, ever have what's called a magnetic monopole, which is a north pole without a south pole. Every magnet has two poles. If I were to take a magnet and break it in half, what I would get would be two weaker magnets, each one of which has a north and south pole. You could never just take the north pole off of a magnet and only have the north pole. Just like with charges, opposite poles attract, like poles repel, and north pole is short for north seeking pole. It's the end of a magnet that if you were to just let swing, would point north. Uh, every magnet has a magnetic field around it and magnetism pretty much comes from the motion of electrons inside atoms. Atoms with electrons, well, electrons have two kinds of motion. They are orbiting the nucleus, kind of like planets orbiting the sun, but they're also spinning on their axis that we call electron spin. Both of those cause a magnetic field. Uh, three main kinds of material. Do I have this here? Uh, so the three kinds of materials that can be magnetized are iron, nickel, and cobalt. Those are sort of our three main materials. And the reason is, is these materials have what's called magnetic domains. These are clusters of billions and billions of atoms inside the iron or nickel or cobalt that all have their magnetic fields lined up. 
So if I looked at, let's say, a piece of iron, nickel, or cobalt that wasn't magnetized, what I would see is inside the piece of iron, there's billions and billions and billions and billions and billions and billions of electrons and atoms. This little arrow would represent what we call a magnetic domain, which might be like 7 billion atoms that all have their magnetic fields pointing downwards. Well, in a normal unmagnetized piece of iron, for every magnetic domain that you have pointing in one direction, you have another one pointing in the opposite direction so they cancel each other out. So this would be non-magnetized. But if I brought a really strong magnet nearby, I could cause a bunch of the domains to line up. And when I have a bunch of these domains all pointing in the same direction, this is when something would be, this would be magnetized. So really, what's the difference between like, why isn't a wood pencil able to be magnetized, whereas a nail is? In order to be magnetized, you have to have magnetic domains that can be induced to all pointing in about the same direction. That only happens if the material contains iron, nickel, cobalt, or some combination of those. Uh, magnetic thing, uh, mag, uh, where I had it. Mm -hmm. Do I have here magnetic? Oh, oh yeah. So most magnets, not most, magnets are not really permanent because you can destroy a magnet's magnetic properties by dropping it, by heating it, because that'll jostle some of the magnetic domains out of alignment. Last thing from this chapter is magnetism is sort of a weird force. One, if I have a really strong magnet, I could have the world's strongest magnet and have a charged electron nearby. If that electron's not moving, it will not feel a force. A charged particle must be moving to feel a force in a magnetic field. And not only does it have to be moving, but it can't be moving so that it's parallel to the field. So meaning if the magnetic field, let's say, had, was pointing straight up and I shot an electron straight up, that electron would not feel any force. Not only does it have to be moving, but it has to be moving at some angle to the magnetic field. And I can't explain why, that's just, just how nature works. Okay, so then chapters 19 and 20, very similar. Chapter 19 is all about vibrations and waves. So all waves are created by something that is oscillating or vibrating. So something is oscillating up and down, back and forth. That creates a disturbance that travels through the medium. The medium is just what the wave is traveling through. So for sound, the medium is air or water. For uh, you know, ocean waves, the medium is water. We generally classify waves into two kinds. They're either longitudinal or transverse. Transverse is sort of the normal wave that we're thinking about that kind of looks like a sine or a cosine wave. It's when the disturbance, let's we'll say, is perpendicular to the direction of travel of the wave. Things that you should know about waves are wavelength, frequency, amplitude, period. So wavelength, how long the wave is. Frequency is how many waves pass a given point in a given period, given amount of time. Amplitude is the height of the wave. And keep in mind, amplitude is always from the middle of the wave to the highest point or the middle of the wave to the lowest point. So if this is my wave, highest point is called a crest, lowest point is called a trough, the amplitude is the distance from the middle to the highest or the middle to the lowest. It's not the highest point to the lowest point, that would be twice the amplitude. Big giant equation that applies for all waves, wave speed equals wavelength times frequency. And keep in mind, this equation makes it seem like if I increase the frequency, the wave speed would increase. But wave speed only depends upon properties of the material, the medium, not the wavelength or frequency. So if the frequency were to go up, the wavelength would go down, but the wave speed is constant. It doesn't change. Waves can undergo this uh, interesting thing called interference, where if I have two waves that exist at the same time at the same place, 
they will affect each other. And that could produce either what's called constructive interference, which the result is a bigger wave, or destructive interference, the result is a smaller wave, or it can completely cancel each other out. And all waves can undergo interference. Light waves, sound waves, water waves, any wave can interfere with another wave. Well, any similar waves. Like I can't have a light wave interfering with a sound wave and so on. Uh, talked a little bit about standing waves. You should know the difference between nodes and anti-nodes. And then Doppler effect. If a source of waves is moving, you are going to detect a different frequency than is being emitted. If you're moving towards a source of waves or it's moving towards you, you're going to detect a higher frequency than it's emitting. Uh, chapter 19 was sort of continuing this waves, but now we're looking specifically at sound, which is a longitudinal wave. And it's always produced by an object which is vibrating. And the frequency of the sound is the same as the frequency of the vibrating object. So if you had an object which is oscillating back and forth 100 times a second, that would produce a 100 hertz sound. As humans, most healthy young adults can hear between 20 and 20,000 hertz. As you get older, that higher range starts to drop. Like I think I can only hear up to like 16,000 hertz. Sound can travel in any material, but it cannot travel in a vacuum. And sound tends to travel fastest in a solid and slowest in a gas. So sound will travel about four times faster in water than it will in air, about 15 times faster in steel than it will in air. <clears throat> but sound cannot travel in a vacuum. In space, no one can hear you scream. <laughs> and sound, the speed of sound depends upon temperature. The higher the temperature, the greater the speed of sound. So on a hot day, sound will travel a little bit faster than on a cold day. Sound can also produce interference. And if I have two sources of sound that are close together in frequency and I play them at the same time, I can hear beats. And the frequency of the beats would be the difference between the two frequencies. So if I had like one frequency, I had a tuning fork, let's say it had 200 hertz and I had another tuning fork that I played and had 205 hertz, and I played them both at the same time, the frequency of the beats would then be five hertz. And the beats were the wah wah. <laughs> so a beat frequency of five hertz means you would hear wah 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 five times a second. And then resonance is when, let me just type in there. Uh, what was I doing? Lecture notes, review for second celebration. Everything has a natural frequency it wants to oscillate at. Resonance is when you f apply forced vibrations to an object. So I'm forcing it to vibrate at a certain frequency by exerting a force on it. Well, if the frequency of my forced vibrations matches the frequency it wants to oscillate at, I get this huge increase in amplitude, and that's what resonance is. And then chapter 26 that we just covered, properties of lights. Important things are, what is light? It's an electromagnetic wave that consists of oscillating electric and magnetic fields. All electromagnetic waves travel through space, through a vacuum, at the same insane speed the greatest known speed in the universe, 186,000 miles per second. Electromagnetic spectrum consists of electromagnetic waves of all frequencies, from radio waves all the way up to gamma rays, and visible light is just the smallest, teeny tiny portion of all the light that's out there. We can't see radio waves, we can't see ultraviolet, we can't see gamma rays, we can just see this very narrow range. Talked a bit about how light passes through a transparent material. It's always getting absorbed and then re-emitted by electrons that absorb the light, start to oscillate at the same frequency, and then emit identical light. And then today I talked about opaque objects. They're objects that absorb the light, and because of resonance, they start to oscillate a lot. And rather than emitting light, they oscillate enough that they run into neighboring atoms and they lose all of that energy they absorbed as heat. 
and the object and therefore heat up. And then last but not least, talk about just eclipses and how we see. And that's kind of it. Celebration number two. So let me stop this. All right. Uh, got about a minute. Any quick questions that I can answer for anybody? If not, I'm going to take out class. Good luck on the second celebration. Remember, available tomorrow starting at 8 a.m. Must be done by Saturday at 11.59. Thank you, everybody. Good luck on the second celebration. And uh, yeah, I'll see you next week. Two more weeks of classes.